Our Sunday study of St. Mark's Gospel continues today in chapter 9. And John answered him, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not with us. So we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man who can do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our side. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to me, daily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. If any of you are a mystery fan, you probably know the Chesterton series. The scene in the Who Done It is a parish priest by the name of Father Brown. In one fascinating case, the criminal happened to be the mailman. And he escaped detection for a long time because everybody was so used to seeing him make his rounds, nobody noticed him at all. Like a cup of water to drink, says Jesus. So ordinary, so common, you probably don't even see it. For some things, because we're so used to seeing them, we don't see them at all. Familiarity breeds not only contempt, as the proverb says, but also blindness. It takes a keen eye to see what is obvious. And this little cup of water began over the question, who is the greater? Earlier that day, the disciples had quarreled among themselves over that very question. And out of earshot of Jesus, for so they thought. Later that evening, they were taken aback when Jesus quietly asked them, uh, What were you arguing about along the way? Well, nobody made a peep. And no wonder. Jesus is telling them he's laying down his life for others. Yeah, I've been about who can lord it over others. He doesn't scold them. Gathers them around. He says, since you ask, I shall tell you. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Please, there is a place called first place. And there is a thing called greatness. But not by your standard. And not in my company. So he called the little child into the circle of these grown men, took the wee bit of a thing up in his arm, and said, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The road to greatness lies through self-sacrifice, not self-assertiveness. It lies through bending down, stooping, serving the lowest, the least, the littlest. That's the way I saved you. And that's the way and the only way you will ever help others. At that point, John interrupts. The words of Christ reminded him of something. He had done recently, and was so sure of himself at the time, but now he's wondering. Master, we saw a man driving out devils in your name, and we told him to stop. We don't know who that man was, where he came from, or when this incident occurred. Only, he was not one of the twelve, nor was he a member of the larger circle of seven days. And so, they saw him as a maverick, an outsider, a competitor, 
whose freewheeling style was a loose cannon on board their ship of organizational unity. And when John says we, uh, we told him to stop, he could be talking about the twelve as a group, but more likely, we means John and his brother James. Jesus nicknamed the two brothers Boanerges. Sons of thunder. And you can certainly see why. The two boys grew up by the Sea of Galilee. And as brothers, they played along the sandy shoreline, climbing in all over the boats and the rigging, pretending to be pirates, listening to the stories and the salty language of the old men in the fleet, looking for the day when they were old enough to go along with the feel of the deck under their feet, the wind in their hair, the spray in their faces, a life of adventure, and a rough and tumble life it was. If you've ever spent any time down on the waterfront of any port city and mingled among the longshoremen, the merchant mariner, the professional sailor, you got some idea of how these boys were br Until the day that Jesus came along and called them, follow me. And they did. But they brought their stormy temperament along with them. There's another occasion. A Samaritan village has refused food and lodging to their little group. So James and John pipe up, Lord, let's call down fire from heaven and destroy them all. Well, that's the way they settled things back in their old neighborhood, down on the docks. If words don't do it, then your fist will. Jesus does not stamp out of them all of the fire and the passion and the adventure. Jesus accepts them just the way they are. He, in his wonderful way, removes them and channels their energy in another direction. I would say you can't do it. A person is what he is, period. Oh, but Jesus can do it. This angry, hot-tempered young man, this son of born orgies, became John, the apostle of brotherly love. And later on, his New Testament epistles are glowing evidence. Jesus can take the rough, raw materials of our lives, the jagged edges and deformed personality, and fashion them into a thing of beauty for God. And it's an old and sorry chapter in church history. All the crimes that have been committed in the name of religion, in the guise of orthodoxy and denominational loyalty, in the name of narrow sectarianism and religious bigotry. And Jesus could have answered them. Hey, two days ago, a distraught father asked you to cast an unclean spirit out of his tormented son, and you couldn't do it. Well, this guy's doing exactly what you couldn't do, and I'll take his way of doing it, to your way of not doing anything at all. Ah, but Jesus is more generous than that. He said, don't stop the man. Anybody who can do a miracle in my name cannot lightly speak evil of me. And if there are others out there doing marvelous things in Jesus' name, why should that bother you? 
Christ is the centerpiece of our faith, not us Christians. And Jesus laid down a simple rule to follow. He that is not against us is on our side. I mean, if the guy's helping us, he can't be hindering us. If he's gathering with us, he cannot at one and the same time be scattering. Be careful of dictating where and when and in whom the Holy Spirit must do his work. There are areas of our life today where all your human ingenuity and your psychological counseling and your physical therapy don't amount to heal a being. Don't you see? Spiritual malady needs spiritual remedy. That's why St. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And he says, put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth around your waist, wearing the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the everlasting gospel above all. You take the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it doesn't need your puny efforts or mine to make it effective. I know you've seen it. People out there who are not of our brotherhood or fellowship. Doing wonderful things in the name of Christ and by his power. Jesus turns it around. You may be persecuted, but you are never to be the persecutor. How could you be if you are last of all and servant of all? You people especially are recipients of mercy. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall give to you a cup of cool water in my name, and because you belong to me, I will accept that as a service done for me. And I will never forget it. And you're saying, well, it's just a little thing. It doesn't rank up there with miracles of causing the lame to walk and casting out demons. I know it. That's why you're apt to miss it. Jesus believed it. He taught it, and I'm telling you, he held to it, even to the bitter end on Calvary. Even there, he thought of others first, for those who were murdering him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then, a promise to a fellow sufferer, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise and commended his aged mother into the keeping of his friend. And then and only then did he think of his own needs and cried out, I thirst. At which point the most unusual thing happened. An unnamed soldier soaked the sponge in a bowl of sour wine, put it on a stick, and pressed it to his parched lips. Just a little thing, and it wouldn't make any difference or change the outcome. The guy's dying anyway, you could say, and that's what they said. Well, it ought to stir your imagination that one day, and on the last day, that ancient, unknown soldier will stand before the great white throne and there see a faith that he recognizes, but that ain't it. The Lord will recognize that soldier's case and say with finality, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. 
And then as much as you've done it for the least of these, my brother, you have done it unto me. Amen.